drapes, basic surgical equipment. There are a lot of procedures that we couldn't perform because we didn't have access to that equipment. And as a result, patients suffered because we couldn't provide them with procedures or services that we could have provided for them here in America. Dr. Irfan Galeria, we have to end the conversation here, but we're going to continue online at democracynow.org. People can hear and watch our web exclusive. Um, Dr. Galeria is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Uh, he wrote an L.A. Times op-ed headlined, I'm an American doctor who went to Gaza. What I saw wasn't war. It was annihilation. That does it for our show. Uh, happy belated birthday to Neil Shabata. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Faust, Mike Burke, Dina Guster, Sharifa Gokadus, Messiah Rhodes, Nareen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warnoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Malkoff, Tamar Astu, Joe John Hamilton, Ravi Karen, Hani Masood, and Hannah Elias. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grand, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Somehow she gets all those names, and you're listening to Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI, 90.3 FM, HD Minneapolis, streaming around the world at kfai.org. It is non-commercial, community-powered radio for your Twin Cities. The time is now 1 o'clock. Um, oh, I was about to tell you what the, what the weather is out there, but I've lost it entirely. Um, it's 75 degrees inside, <laughs> inside the studios here at Cedar Riverside. Uh, a bird must have knocked our... Uh, well, what the heck? Uh, I don't know. Let's call it what forty something, thirty something. Maybe, maybe Al McFarland will know. Conversations with Al McFarland starting shortly here, and uh, we will. In fact, I thought it would be starting right now. Nothing, nothing is happening in the way that I was expecting. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. You're listening to the conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you along as well. And uh, it's actually sunny and 44 degrees in Minneapolis and St. Paul right now. And uh, if you're like me, you're just blown away at how uh, warm and how beautiful and how comfortable it feels. And though we have feelings for all of our people that are in the cold business and the snow business, uh, they're losing money big time right now. But be that as it may, uh, many people feel relief and some uh, less uh, winter gloom, uh, winter blues, winter blahs, because it's so warm, it's so sunny, it's so nice. So however it's working for you, uh, enjoy this day. I've got some great days ahead. So it's going to be really exciting. Unusual, unusual for this time of year. So uh, I think we have to just... Uh, grace to enjoy being warm uh, in February and early March. Well, uh, I want to thank all of our friends who stay with us here at KFAI. Uh, what a great station this is. What a great program, Amy Goodman. And what a great mix of programs that we have. And uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, keep listening, keep tuning in, keep supporting Fresh Air Community Radio. I want to also thank uh, all of you who have been following the conversation with Al McFarland across our social media platforms. You know, we stream on uh, Twitter, on Facebook uh, for Al McFarland. Uh, we stream on LinkedIn, and we are on uh, two YouTube channels, one for Black Press USA, the Black Press of America, and the Insight News YouTube channel. We pay particular attention to the Insight News uh, YouTube channel because we're inviting and encouraging people to become subscribers to the channel. We want to grow it. We're happy to announce that we've crossed our 600 subscriber uh, uh, count in the past few days. Our target now is 1,000. And if you're not a subscriber, uh, tell somebody, uh, 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 click on and uh, like and share and be part of the conversation with Alan McFarland. Well, 
Uh, speaking of uh, what our plans are, we've got some great things ahead for you as well. Um, so tomorrow, uh, we're having uh, members of the uh, organization that presents the Minnesota Cuban Film Festival. Uh, my friends, uh, Franklin Corvello and Greg Clave will be here talking about this year's Cuban Film Festival. You don't want to miss the program. Uh, it's online tomorrow. It's the um, the online edition at, at Insight News uh, YouTube channel. But tune in, uh, click on, and enjoy a great conversation about the upcoming Cuban Film Festival. Thursday is going to be a book check with our Insight News books and book review editor, W.D. Foster Graham. He's interviewing James Darnell Johnson, a Minnesota author. Great interview. You're going to enjoy it. And then on Friday, uh, we're having uh, Anissa Keys, who's an entrepreneur and a, uh, a healer. She's created a healing business therapy company here in, uh, in three locations in Twin Cities. She's like going uh, like on fire. So we'll have a conversation with her about healing, about therapy, about how we uh, continue to move towards uh, well-being, towards health towards being healed and towards being healers in our daily walk. Well, and hopefully uh, in the future, you're going to start seeing uh, a full week in advance of the scheduled shows uh, in Insight News. So uh, we want to keep you informed about the programs coming up, great programs. Uh, if you want to be on the program, uh, either on this program on Tuesday or any of the other programs are on five days a week online, uh, call us up, send us an email, uh, send it to cooper at insightnews.com. He's our producer, and he'll uh, connect with you. Also, we want uh, people to check out our newest project, uh, TikTok. We've got a TikTok uh, presence now, so it's TikTok at insightnewsmn. Uh, check it out. Let us know what you think. Show us how we can improve, and uh, if it if it meets your expectation, we hope that it will. We believe we'll just keep getting better uh, as we go. Well, today I've invited uh, representatives of one of my favorite organizations in Twitty, Twin Cities, and that is the uh, Children's Theater Company. Today I have uh, as a guest uh, Autumn Ness, and she is celebrating her 23rd season as a member of the Children's Theater Company acting company or CTC acting company, it's properly called. And uh, uh, she's a playwright, uh, a, an actor. Uh, among her favorite shows, she says, uh, Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Annie Cinderella, uh, Roald Dahl's Matilda the Musical, The Biggest Little House in the Forest, The Jungle Book, and Romeo and Juliet. Autumn is a recipient of the 2018 TCG Fox Foundation Fellowship, the 2020 MRAC Next Step Fund, and the 2022 Minnesota State Arts Board Creative Support Grant. Uh, Autumn, welcome to the conversation. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I like that <laughs> intro you do. I sound quite impressive. When you <laughs> it's, it's, only, it's only because you are, you know. I'm going to so, that when I feel down. <laughs> well, so good to see you. And how, how are you dealing with today's weather? Isn't it amazing? What, I'm watching what? these sunbeams through my window, but now all I can think is, what are they going to do to my light as they come in <laughs> <to> my <laughs> shots? Sure, 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 sure. Well, it's a beautiful day. I can see outside from where I am. Mm -hmm. I uh, do my show from my dining room table, and I've got a beautiful uh, street view in front of me and neighbor's house on the side. Blinds are down at the moment to control the light. But I tell you, I just came in from outside from driving to St. Paul and back, and it's beautiful outside, and I'm loving it. So I hope you're having uh, the same kind of wonderful feeling about this day as well. I'm a lifetime Minnesotan, so I'm ready to be tricked at any yeah. moment. <laughs> <laughs> My whole life, I'm prepared for it to be like, it's May. Here's the you, snow. You're, you're, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, as they say, right? And it could drop any minute, right? I've got my armor up. Whatever happens <laughs> outside, I won't let it surprise me. Uh, well, 
what's going on now at Children's Theater? Tell us about what's happening and, and in the process, continue to in, invite people to connect any way they can because they need to be connected to this work, to the mission. Always so much happening, as you know. That question, we could go on. Do we only have an hour? We could talk for longer. But I, I just myself uh, left the Alice in Wonderland opening night party on our main stage. So that began just this last weekend. And then I am working on um, my own show, which is in our secondary space, in our Cargill Theater space. And this one is called Babble Lab. And this one is for our youngest audience members. This is for three to five-year-olds, preschool audiences, uh, and not many people want to perform for this age group because they're scared uh, and they're wrong. This is my favorite age group to perform for and mm -hmm. to create for uh, because not only are they uh, uh, honest and come as you are and open and imaginative and ready to talk back and tell you what your character should do and where you should go and what's behind you and what they had for breakfast, uh, but they're also our future theater goers, story mm -hmm. makers, imagination makers. So we love to get them in for what's most likely their first theatrical experience, or, uh, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. We want to get them in, show them that the theater is not a, a frightening place. Anywhere new can be frightening when you're three years old and it's big and you're tiny and, and there's uh, adults and different lighting and different sounds. We want to get them in. We have done years and years and years of research on how you welcome in a group this young and uh, make them have a positive experience with their first live art piece. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, first of all, you have to rethink everything from their angle, from their point of view. So uh, how are we going to sit? How are we going to be able to see? Uh, wh what are the lights going to do? What's too loud? What's too bright? What about our, our shoes and messy winter wet trails that we all leave? How can we take care of that? What about being with adults that we trust and that make us feel safe, but also having a little separation so we can get kind of brave? All of these things are things we take into account before the show even starts. So before the first line is spoken or the first light cue comes up, we bring them in, we get everybody changed out of their boots into sort of clean room booties. <laughs> nobody's stepping on little fingers, nobody's dragging Minnesota snow in with them. Yeah. We make sure the temperature's right, the sound levels are right. We have lobby time to decompress and to get used to seeing the space you're gonna see for the next hour. Mm. We have helpers that come up and say, it's now 10 minutes until we open the doors. It's five minutes, it's two minutes. That preparation that's so important when you're out and being social, when you're three, when you're four. Mm -hmm. We have our, uh, our first intro to the character as silent. It's a, it's a lot of sensory information just to take in me walking in in a costume mm -hmm. and looking at you and you're wondering, is it TV? Is it a movie? Can mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I'm not sure. My experience is my iPad. Can I talk to this person? Uh, so there aren't any lines spoken yet. We let you get used to that visual, get used to the room where you are. Then we have seating for the kids that, oh my gosh, the front row is about six inches off the ground because that's mm -hmm. high for them. Mm -hmm. And I've even seen some take a tumble off of that. <laughs> they manage it somehow. And the preparation, we have a very small audience that's allowed in. We Our main stage caps out at 750. This show caps out at 100. Okay. We don't want more than that. We want them to feel so excited and free to go into the story mm -hmm. and to let their imagination run wild because that's what they're so good at. And these shows, when I perform for the preschool audiences, they have you laughing so hard on the inside. You try just not to break character because the things they say and the things they offer and what they want you to know about their lives, about their breakfast, about uh, this one story that they have that has nothing to do with what's going on, mm -hmm. but it's relevant to them. We welcome all of that. That's mm -hmm. them bringing their full selves. Mm -hmm. We also welcome in our research with our preschool age group, we know listening can look differently for every kid. You and I are listening to each other right now and we're quite still and we're looking at one another and yep. that's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. 
they may have a way of doing it where it's somersault back yep. and forth. They may have a way yeah. where it's where just their hands are up in the air and maybe they mm -hmm. shake. Whatever it is that they bring their version of listening, we welcome that. Come as you are. It's a no shushing zone. Mm -hmm. They're going to have things to say. They're going to repeat sometimes just what I say. That's something we're prepared for. And we, we love it. We write down some of the great quotes. Sometimes Sometimes they'll stand up five minutes after the play is, is started and go, well, best show ever. Like I've had enough of that. <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> and I, or we've had the opposite. We've had someone come in. I remember a little girl came in and she was having just a rough morning. And I, re I could hear her something about carrots that was upsetting her. The play hadn't started yet. <laughs> she yelled out, I hate this show already. <laughs> <laughs> we write it all down. We try not to laugh because it's so delightful how free the kids are when they come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's emphatic, right? She's a, de a declaration, right? Rest well, assured, by the end, she was I'm dead the best of them. She had her somersaults going. <laughs> Not about the carrots, whatever it was that upset her. Uh, Rest assured, we make sure to get them there. I'm constantly listening while I'm doing the show. We always tell actors to listen. And then we sort of get to where we're very caught up in how dramatic we're being and how great we must look. And we, we tend to stop. This audience, you, you must listen. You must be uh, it constantly in tune with with what they're doing, what they're feeling, what they're saying. And sometimes it can affect, boy, I think I need to slow down. I think the volume just needs to come down because you need them to come to you. Mm -hmm. You need any audience to do that. But with this one, boy, you need to be at a place where they feel free to approach the show. You cannot force the show at them. Let, let me ask you, uh, Autumn, why the name Bamble Lab? What's the significance of that name and what names did you have to choose from and how did this one emerge as the uh, uh, the voice or the name or the vehicle for carrying this work? Well, uh, this is my first work as a writer, as a playwright, so I could choose from anything. <laughs> the power has gone to my head uh, because it's a pretty great gig getting to sit down at that computer and just go with where your imagination leads you. Uh, but this show is about um, uh, a, la a fantastical laboratory, part science, part inventor, part made up uh, uh, um, uh, science that we invented because this world, Babble Lab, starts in a world without speech. There is no version of communication, talking, reading, letters, writing. She comes into her laboratory, this scientist, this fantastical scientist, and she's uh, working with sound. Maybe she squeezes a balloon. Maybe she has a uh, dog toy that, that has a squeaky sound. Maybe a slinky that has a metal clanging sound. And like all science, through a series of accidents, just like penicillin, she invents a letter. Mm -hmm. And she she measures the letter and she puts it under a microscope. She can't figure out what in the world this thing is that she has created. She eats it. We shouldn't eat our science experiments. That's <laughs> true. say from me. And she discovers she can speak. Well, what happens when we open our mouths? Wonderful things. We can get our needs met. We can mm -hmm. sting. We can make rhythms. We can talk and tell jokes and laugh. Those are the great things that happen when we communicate with each other. What else happens when we can communicate with each other? We say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. We get angry. We fight. We're short. I wanted to show these kids at this moment where they're learning their speech. They're learning how to get their needs met. They're learning how to communicate with friends, with teachers. They're learning to read. They're learning to write. They're learning to express their imagination, to tell you what it is they're feeling, thinking. I want to show the good, the bad, and the ugly of that time. Mm. For me, and for, well, not for me, for so many parents, I'm not alone in this at all. Those times with my own kids, uh, those that should be fantastic times. Mm -hmm. I said a full sentence, learn to read a board book, a picture book, uh, recognize their letters, wrote their name. Those are great milestones. 
those milestones can be fraught. Mm -hmm. um, both of my own boys are on the autism spectrum. So a lot of those milestones came in a roundabout way where we weren't sure if we were on track. We were excited they were happening. We were excited they were growing. We wanted to support them. But we knew there were things that were not typical, as so many parents experience. And when you start to reach out to um, medical people, to personnel at school, to a para, to a counselor, and say, we just want to check on this, that road, while wonderful here in Minnesota and supported and just so many wonderful people want to step in and help your child uh, just be their best and be on track academically, that road can be confusing, mm -hmm. heartening, uh, uh, seem long. So these wonderful times with these young ones that we're performing for, they have their own pitfalls. Even at three, can you imagine? You feel like you know, you're three, what are your cares? Well, they have a lot going on. Sure. Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And developing is no easy path. And it's not a straight path. Mm -hmm. And as we were um, in and out of, of offices and talking with all the, the various and helpful personnel, this show sort of built itself about, you know, c communicating our, our first babbles. Those can be tricky. And maybe there are parents who will uh, be experiencing that same thing in the audience. I, in fact, I'm, I'm sure there will be. And uh, it, it'll go right over that aspect, right over a three, four-year-old's head. But I know that um, at Children's Theater, we always want to connect with the whole family. Because that three-year-old is bringing the older sister, the younger brother, the grandma, mm -hmm. the neighbor. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that everybody has an in for the show. So uh, not only is the show speaking to the fun of these firsts when you're young, but it's it's speaking to the uh, the trials that they have as well. So what's the staging like? I mean, how does it work? You say you tell people 10 minutes, five minutes, doors open. What happens then? They're, I'm oh, presuming right. they're in an atrium or lobby or somewhere. Then what goes on? Exactly. Good question. If you want to get a hundred three-year-old somewhere, a lot. <laughs> 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 now what do we have to do? Now we seat and we want to make sure everyone knows this is your chair. We'll make sure you can see. This is a good chair for you to return to if you have to get up and go. You need a break. You need the bathroom, whatever it is. You come back here. This will be waiting for you. So we get them uh, seated. We, we heard the cats, as it were, in the, in the most sensory friendly way possible. And then our staging, we want to make sure is never overwhelming if I'm standing over you, looming over you as an actor, if I'm moving too quickly so that you can't keep up, catch up. We want to, to uh, make sure we're checking in our movement and uh, the flow of the story and the flow of what's happening on stage so that we can always make sure our youngest audience members, who it's for, are, uh, are keeping up and are also gaining confidence as they watch the story and they go, I get it, I get it. I get the world. I think I'm going to yell out now. I think I know. <laughs> I love that confidence that they gain from the walk-in. I'm not sure about this place. I've never been here. To like, hey, lady, it's behind <laughs> you. <laughs> and then we have an element in Babble Lab, which is new for me. At uh, I think it's new at Children's Theater, which is we have interactive imagination or um, animation, and interactive animation happening as I learn to speak. So as I'm learning that I can say, I can sing and I can say, but, 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 as loud as I want and mm -hmm. I can shout and I can jump. We have uh, an animator who's come in and we have screens behind me that can show out of my mouth comes. Bah, 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 bah. And maybe if I say it really, really long, it grows into a great big giant bubble and I have to pop it. And maybe if I say it really fast, it fills up the screen and the mm -hmm. screen suddenly goes completely white with all the letters and the words that I've mm -hmm. said. Maybe it spins and I get dizzy. Maybe it turns into a tree that grows out of letters and I can blow the leaves off. So that's been a really, for me as an actor, a wonderful challenge to learn. So do, so, so do the kids in the audience get to tell their stories as part of the show or how does it, or is it interactive in that way or not? Interactive in the way that we hope when I start saying, ba, fa, fooms, ba, ba, po, 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 
out in the audience, I hear pa 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 and when we when we dance, because that's how we want to express ourselves, we know they'll pop right up out of their seats and they'll dance. We know that uh, when we finish at the end, we want to make sure that we're saying goodbye to everyone, that mm -hmm. we're touching base with everyone. We need everyone to get a, a souvenir. So we have this fantastic Michael Summers is our uh, puppet and set designer, and um, he's created this cutout that they can take home. It has a picture of the show. Mm -hmm. They can cut it out and recreate one of the puppet butterflies that we have in the show. It's just really important that we curate the experience from start to finish in that way. You can't turn the lights on, on a three-year-old and go, well, that's it. Bye-bye, closing time. That's not how they have closure. And we know that stopping an activity that's fun, that's hard when you're four. So we take the show from the whole, the whole experience is an hour. We take it from before the hour starts all the way through to where you're exiting the lobby mm -hmm. uh, so that you can look back on it and you feel like you had that entire story told to you and made for you and you have a piece of it to bring home. That's amazing. I'm Alan McFarland. This is the conversation with Alan McFarland. I'm talking with Autumn Ness, uh, as I said earlier, she celebrated her 23rd season as a member of the CTC acting company. And she's a playwright, a writer, uh, and uh, an actor. And presently, we're talking about her production uh, 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 called Babble Lab. And uh, it's a unique uh, proposition that uh, seeks to examine uh, language itself. Uh, it examines joy and struggle uh, that we have uh, learning to express ourselves and how to communicate not only uh, as children, the apparent uh, intended audience, but I bet you uh, there is enough for everybody to learn. Uh, all of us 80 year old, uh, 70 year old children as well can take something away. Uh, but you know, your notes here say that this show uh, is created to be a less restrictive environment for all the, the children. And that, as you said, you expect the children to express themselves during the show and you welcome uh, people uh, feeling free to be themselves. Talk more about that. How does that uh, intention surface and what's maybe some stories of how that, in a way that surprised you, uh, revealed itself as the right thing to do well, one of my favorite things about Children's Theater Company is that we're always striving for what you said, that least restrictive environment, that environment that supports the kids that are coming in, the size, the attention span, their needs that they're going to have during the show. I think about the last theater or concert space I was in that wasn't CTC, and I think about the aisle, and I think about my knees up in my chin, and how I know, no matter how badly I may have to get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, whatever it is I have to do, I'm stuck. Mm. There's nowhere I'm going. There's no way I'm going to get my needs met. And if I even have to want to be polite and let somebody else have their needs met, maybe let somebody else come and go, we're going to have to negotiate that together. Mm. At CTC, I love that we set ourselves up to say, right from the ground plan. How are we gonna support this audience? Let's move these seats apart. Let's keep these lights just a little bit up. First of all, for our confidence, cause we're a young audience. Second of all, cause we know if we've got to come and go or we have a spill or we have a brother and sister that decide they both want each other's chairs, whatever that situation's gonna be, we are gonna make that environment open to what your needs are gonna be as an audience. So you don't even notice that you are having a, a flow as you're watching the show. Little ones may want to go from their primo front seat back to mom and dad. Just give them a tap while you're here. You still exist. Huh? Forgot about you. Walk mm -hmm. right down to the front. That's what we're setting that up for. And we're also setting them up to know that how they are going to behave, how they are going to express themselves, standing, sitting, talking, whatever it is, they are welcome to do that. As a parent, when I would take my kids places when they were little, I, I, I was stressed. I was worried about them 
being disruptive, about disturbing uh, other families, maybe getting like a fish eye from another parent. Oh, why, right. <laughs> yeah. Why can't you all just be quiet like a nice audience member participant? Uh, we want the parents as well. And we say this before they come and we want them to feel in what we've set up. Mm -hmm. You come as well and let your child be brave and be as they are. There's a, there's a little bit of method behind saying before the show, mm -hmm. you can sit separate. You go ahead and you can sit in the back. If you, there's a chair for you there. And as a parent, sometimes you get very reluctant. Oh, I don't know how they'll take it. I don't know. What, what if they really misbehave and I'm, and everybody turns to me. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> we have those stresses ourselves as confident adults who know how to go out and be in the world. Sure. We want to protect those parents too mm. and set up in what we've given them it's so that they can spend an hour watching their child and watching their child delight and maybe experience something with a confidence the parent didn't expect. Mm -hmm. I, I, as you're just talking there, I, I'm remembering and I, I can visualize a uh, hundred anxious parents, each one of them playing the same story in her or his mind and that is, is uh, my son or daughter uh, going to be cool or is this going to be the meltdown, right? Is this the meltdown moment? And you don't <laughs> want to be scared of the meltdown. <laughs> and then when it happens, you think maybe they won't know it's my <laughs> All right. <laughs> I had in my previous preschool show, I've done shows for this audience at Children's Theater before. And uh, my own kids were, were that age and they came uh -huh. to the show. And sure enough, just what I thought, oh, I, I kind of hope this doesn't happen, happened. My youngest was up, bouncing, mm -hmm. you know, sort of talking and singing in a way that he was experiencing the show. Mm -hmm. But in my back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, okay, maybe don't, don't reveal that you're mine. Oh, he turned proud as can be. He turns to me up on stage. Hey, mom. mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, you know, I'm holding puppets. I'm turning this set. I'm keeping the show going. And my son outed me, my uh -huh. anxious one. He turned, hey, mom. And I got a great laugh from the audience. They all uh -huh. It worked. That's that's amazing. That's wonderful. Uh, let's talk about your career, your development, and how you came uh, to the arts and to theater and to writing. You said I, you're a native of Minnesota, lifelong native Minnesota. Minnesota. I was in children's theater company shows since I was eight years old. Uh, that 23 years that you read off, that seems mm -hmm. so long, I know. That's <laughs> only as a grown up. Mm. I was there when I was a student, mm -hmm. uh, which absolutely was the, the first place that I saw a play that ignited so much love for the arts in me. And, and also ignited a little cockiness where I said, well, I can do that you mm -hmm. know, up there. All right. <laughs> parents, found it in their busy schedule to direct, because it's no joke to drive your kid to an activity that's going to become their life. Mm -hmm. Found it in their schedule, found it in their hearts to take me in for an audition. I had my first audition at Children's Theater Company and my first audition anywhere in the room in the dance studio where I'm rehearsing right now. So that's mm -hmm. a really small circle for yeah, my circle. life, yeah. but, but wonderful. And I remember they gave us each, it was for Hansel and Gretel. They gave us each a piece of a script to read out just to see how we did. Were we loud? Were we animated? Did we get shy? Did we get stage fright? And they handed me the scripts and I thought, oh no, no, this isn't what you want to see. It, Hansel and Gretel is a very scary play. You need to see if I can be very scared. Uh, I'll help out this poor director and these producers who just don't know what it is they want. I'm an eight-year-old. Now, you're thinking this or you're telling them this? I'm thinking this. Thinking it, okay. I'm okay. an eight-year-old wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking I know what to do. So they called my name, Autumn, it's your turn. And I came up and I held the scream in my hand and I, I held the script in my hand and I ignored it. And I opened my mouth and I screamed as loud as I could, as long as I could to show that I knew this was a scary play and I could handle it. Mm. I show the audience, we were terrified. The whole table, the director, the choreographer, all the people sitting at that adjudicator station burst out laughing. <laughs> and I got so mad. I thought, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> I have showed you, I have the capacity. For <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> 
boy, you all don't know what you missed out on. Uh, and I had a big chip on my shoulder the rest of the audition. I think I read the script, but I think I read it like I'll, I'll deign to read this, but you all don't. And I went home. My parents said, how did it go? I said, fine. It was fine. They don't know me. And I got the call. Yes, we'd like her to come in and do the role. She's got the show. It's my very first play. And I like to think, if nothing else, I was memorable. <laughs> and all the kids they saw that day, they thought, let's cast that weird one that just shrieked. Yeah. Screamed. Let's see how that goes. If nothing else, we'll have stories to tell at the end of our work day. Well, I, I love this. You know, so you were really in your eight year old mind, super intentional. You yeah. knew what you were doing. You know, so here's what that reminds me of. Okay. So, like, I had when my kids were like, eight and nine years old or eight and maybe four older, younger daughters here at the house. And I think, uh, you know, everything would be cool all day until they came home from school. And when they got up from school, the energy level in the house went, went from zero to nine the minute they walked in, right? And so it's like, here's the regular sound. Mm -hmm. And they walk in the door. For the rest of the rest of the evening, right? And so one day, one of the you know, kids, the younger of the two, uh, had something she wanted, demanded, wanted to happen, had to happen right now. You can't do anything else. This is done. You got to resolve this. And and she took it beyond the regular 10, 10 level to level thirteen, right? And so what poor parent does in exasperation and desperation, and even without thinking, yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, you, you you give them what they want just to get a break, right? And so I did, and I don't remember what the what the want was, and walked around the corner and came back, but I saw the kid, the four year old, saying, "Okay, I got that. What's next?" I said, "Oh snap! Really? <laughs> that, 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 that's what we're doing?" You know, and so that, that reminded me of your intention. Your intense intention in declaring yourself and raising your uh, version of what it means to be in a scary play. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? <laughs> you had girls. I had boys in the house. I have boys in the house. You don't think boys can do exactly the same thing, right? They're supposed to be sort of, they come home and they're supposed to dude it out and be chill. Uh, no, boys can do the exact same thing. I, I feel yeah. that exactly. But I think. When I think about when you're young, a day, a week, that's like a percentage of your life. Yeah. Like, like yeah. Me, a day, a week, that's not so much. That's not uh, not so significant. When you're young like that, every moment, an hour, it means so much. Mm -hmm. And they, call, you know, they have a word for it now. They call it big feelings. Mm. When, what you called it, oh, throwing a fit or being naughty. Yeah, right. We call it now big feelings. And then, uh, I hear that with my grandson. That yeah. Mindset. Yeah. Of how important of how long I've had to wait for this percentage of my life, or if I do <laughs> now, it's you know we're as parents we get exasperated. Of course, we're human, but it when you're in a quiet moment and when you're in a calm moment, you can take a step back and go, okay, actually for you, this actually is kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At your age. Amazing, amazing. So, so you up in North, South, St. Paul, Twin Cities, or somewhere else? I'm in. I've been in Stillwater for ten years. Okay. I was. I had one son. We. I was pregnant with my second. We had to move. You can't have a baby in another room with a, an older kid. Mm -hmm. And as we were searching and searching for a place to live, maybe a backyard, maybe we could have a dog. We kept going further and further out from the metro, second tier suburb, third tier suburb. And I'm going, okay, the drive's getting longer and longer, right. but we can still do it. Yeah. And my husband and I had always loved Stillwater. It felt, you felt so removed from your day. Mm -hmm. And you felt like every, you were sort of on a, on a day trip. You were on a staycation all the time. And we said, what if we just went for it? Mm -hmm. And that was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, I'm in Minneapolis every day, twice a day, a morning show for uh, student groups or matinee groups. Mm -hmm. in 
show for the public, which sounds like, oh, you spend half your life in the car. Well, as a parent, you spend half your life in the car anyway. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. got to when they get home, they've got places they've got to go and things they've got to do right, right mm -hmm. now, got to do it. So my husband works with me. We've had the same uh, uh, job as company actors at Children's Theater this entire 23 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Mo most people don't don't work with their spouse in that right. way, that length of time. Thank you for any props. <laughs> spouse is working together, living together. We're doing the thing. Yeah. And that is actually that drive that Minneapolis to Stillwater has really become a, either a decompression time on the way home. You don't walk into the house and you're still at work and you're still ironing things out, sending last email, sending last text. That's all done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not still fresh in your mind. You have sort of done that transition while you've been in the car. And on the way to, you gear up, you chat, maybe you run a scene, maybe you run lines, uh, you, maybe you have breakfast, whatever it is. You have that time we've discovered to get, to get some adult conversation. And sometimes it might be the only day he and I see each other. Mm -hmm. Or to just get yourself geared up or chilled out at the end of the day. So it's it's been a really wonderful uh, sort of gift, that gift of time. There's a few days every winter. Mm -hmm. We're still watered in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. That could be three hours. That could be daunting and white knuckle. Through yep, yep. Little, little icy roads. Yeah, sure. But it's only a few times. Mm -hmm. And it's only a couple times a year. <laughs> but so, and we, we just really love. That's great the space for our kids to be a little bit separate from what mom and dad do because the arts as a job is all encompassing mm -hmm. it isn't nine to five it isn't clock out either with your brain or with your time mm -hmm. it you're always it's a piece of you is always with it and when we have just the separation of the distance we're able to remind ourselves okay you've you've done that work for the day you've you've spun out on that problem or you've put forward as much as you can let's be here now Let's be now. Let's attend to the things here. And sometimes just the, the distance on the map can be enough to set our heads straight when it's time to be with family. I uh, <clears throat> so you know, I'm just vibing uh, so much with everything you say because what your story does is remind me of parts of my life, you know, and I, I love that. Uh, as you were talking about <clears throat> working as a family, my wife and I work together as well, uh, owning our business. <laughs> And we, and we have from the very beginning. So it's been the two of us uh, from the very beginning. And that idea of driving at one point in time, our our uh, office was over on University Avenue in St. Paul uh, in a Vietnamese shopping center. It was a, uh, a retail space that we had for publishing our newspaper. <clears throat> and uh, but I remember uh, just the sometimes the act of driving from North Minneapolis to St. Paul, be 12, 15 minute ride on, on the rush hour and stuff. We, we put on Robin Harris or Paul Mooney. I don't know if you know either of those. Those are major black comedians, right? That had massive social commentary, but we'd be driving up and down the road, just laughing our guts out. And the beauty of it was, these were times when the business was really tough and we didn't know if today would be our last day or not, or if you know the, the uh, uh, lights would be turned off or equipment repossessed or whatever. That's how difficult it was uh, being in our own business. And we got to where we said we have to figure out a way to um, to get through this without feeling, you know, wiped out and washed out. And the drive, that's what I was relating to, the drive from home to there and from there to home and having comedy or music, but usually it was Robin Harris or Paul Mooney and uh, laughing, laughing, laughing because it let us, it reminded us of how absurd the whole thing was in the first place, right? And you may as well laugh at this and get up and try it again tomorrow. So it's kind of uh, my story that lets me relate to what you're saying. But that's wonderful to hear that you and your husband have been able to work together for that length of time at Children's Theater. That's an awesome thing. I don't know how I'd work now without him. I mean, it's been yeah. too long. I think I'd turn to look for him if we weren't together. Sure. And you, you know, then there's there's a shorthand that you develop i mean all couples have a shorthand mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. but something that you can read on your way that only you know mm -hmm. 
shorthanded. Also not having, if it's been a rough day, you don't have to ask, oh, how was your day? And that <laughs> this sort of positive way. You just know and you yeah. adjust. It, I can't imagine it any other way now. Well, same here. I, I love to have that. So, so uh, how was children's theater different 23 years ago? And you mentioned you started there when you were eight, but you know, when you became an employee there, what, uh, as you remember, was the excitement, the vision, the possibility, and how has the organization and the work evolved uh, to today? Well, what we're remembering now that when we're talking about arts is the COVID break mm -hmm. and the, the difference that that made for children, for families, for their development, for, for the entertainment industry. Uh, that is the most sizable shift mm -hmm. in recent memory of how people relate to, uh, to an arts event. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say, I believe there is a renaissance coming out of that time. Mm. It's happening now. It's continuing to happen as works get produced that um, people were, were working on it at that time when they had a second to look at the world around them. I, I think there's a renaissance that's coming in and, and will continue to come out of the absence of these kind of events in our lives. Mm -hmm. You couple that with what we at Children's Theater are dealing with, which is audiences that were out of school and therefore and out of activities and therefore for most kids out of social interaction for mm -hmm. two, three years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how that changes as you're developing. We, uh, I taught, the first thing I did when, when we came back from COVID and you could come back into uh, uh, an arts building and have an activity, wasn't performing, it was teaching. Mm -hmm. And my first class back, I must have had second or third graders. So that meant second or third grader at that time meant it, it, they had had no in-person uh, school or activity interaction, maybe in preschool that, that they remembered, probably not. Right. They came in, they were so excited. They were, uh, they were nervous, just like all kids are when they get together with a new group of peers. We did the, f the first activity and in a theater class, you don't really stand in line when you're doing games and activities. Everybody kind of sits in an audience clump on the floor and you watch people um, uh, do their performance or play their character, whatever it is that we're, that we're building towards. And after the first kid went, I said, that's awesome. We're, you know, great imagination on that. Does anyone else have a thought about what they just saw? And every kid that hadn't just gone raised their hand and said, I, I didn't get to try it. I didn't get to go. They had lost building blocks that told them we were all going to take turns. We were all going to get to participate. Mm. Now, not just one person got to experience something when we were in a group or in an activity, that we were all going to try it together those nuts and bolts of how to be together in a classroom, at a, at a basketball practice, at a, at a class, at an art event, those hadn't been developed. They were on Zoom and they were, they were doing their academics as best they could. And mm -hmm. maybe the guardians were next to them trying to help them with links and trying to help them with writing or reading. But they hadn't been all in a room navigating those social rules together that we think of as unwritten because we had that development time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't unwritten for them, it was brand new. And so we're considering uh, uh, in bringing in our audience, that gap and not taking anything for granted about right. what they're going to come in and what knowledge base they're gonna bring. And also the stories we tell. We got, we got to sit on our couch, all of us, and for the betterment of the health of everyone, try to, to stay home and try to stay inside and make sure that, that, that this virus could, could dissipate and we could build immunity. I'd like to think everybody got a bigger world view. This was a global pandemic. It wasn't Minnesota. It mm -hmm. wasn't. Everybody was doing this. And I think at CTC, when we came back, we went, man, let's really iris out on the stories and the point of view and who's telling them. And who's telling them and then who's writing them. And then who's directing them? Mm -hmm. Because if a story is global, and then the lens that you take it through yes. is something that you've seen or that has that has been done, that story's not really getting its blinders off. That story's mm -hmm. then getting boiled down. Mm -hmm. So we just got we got so ambitious while we were away in the best possible way. 
all, I hope all artists did. I believe we did. We got ambitious to tell the biggest story, to involve as many people as possible, and then to listen. We were all in houses together with our family for years. I hope we all became better listeners. And I hope as organizations, we became better listeners and we learned how to step back and how to let another voice come in. I'm Al McFarland. This is the conversation with Al McFarland, my guest, Autumn Ness. She's a performer, writer of the project, the play, uh, Babel Lab. It's currently uh, being presented, right? At uh, March 9th, we kick off. That's when we kick off. What, what's the, the, the run date for that? March 9th to what? We run March 9th for a month. And on our website, childrenstheater.org, you will see a public performances available that you can buy tickets for. But what you don't see that I want to make people know is available is that we have a school shows, morning weekday matinee shows for homeschool group, preschool collectives, daycare groups, for whatever your classroom uh, group social situation is, maybe a mom's group where you get together. We have those morning shows that are not listed in the tickets, but that are available for exactly those kind of groups. And those are really fun because you're bringing in your class mm -hmm. to meet up then and see the show with like-minded, like-aged classes or daycare groups or mom's groups, whatever it might be. And then you get to really widen your view and watch them take off and enjoy it together. And those morning shows are where we've got, oh, we can have as many as like 75 preschoolers. Wow. Just, yes. Wow. Just, yeah rare and to be entertained and then there's just me it's a solo performance so it's i need my wheaties and my vitamins <laughs> and maybe my espresso just to make sure i'm ready to receive them um mm. it's it's worth checking out the website for those tickets and if you're thinking oh wait we don't want to go on the weekend we have those morning matinees as well during the week I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. Again, I'm talking to Olive Ness. She's the writer of Babel Lab, running from March 9th through April 14th at CTC, Children's Theater Company. And we'll keep giving you information so you can uh, find out how you can attend uh, individually or as a group. Uh, there are many, many opportunities. This is such a great conversation. Autumn, thank you for being here. You know, I wanted to... Um, uh, key in on your thought that you believe we're at a point of a, a renaissance and that that renaissance is informed by this global experience of uh, COVID-19, the global pandemic. I would submit that that is also aggravated by and uh, equally influenced by George Floyd uh, as a phenomenon that had a global resonance. Uh, and so as you anticipate this idea of renaissance, what are you imagining will be the fruit of that? Where will it show up uh, in music, in theater, in, in you know crafts, in the visual arts, uh, in the performing arts? What do you see? What do you, I mean, and do you see that in yourself as an artist? And, and then having acknowledged that, uh, do you have an assessment or a thought of how it might be appearing in other human beings as well. I think you're gonna see first and foremost, new voices. Whether those new voices are finally being allowed to step forward and to have their moment, or whether they themselves weren't sure they were ready and they have been propelled to speak, to write, to write music, to write stories, to write plays, to write books, uh, um, to perform. So so let, let's stop there. And, and why is there a sense that they were not allowed to or were prevented either through internal or external pressure that uh, what they could produce wasn't acknowledged or wasn't received or you know, what do you think? I think absolutely. I think there are going to be organizations that maybe wanted to keep uh, um, subscribers happy and they wanted to present what they knew uh, w would fulfill their mission, but would also bring people in. Risks are hard to take in an arts organization. And now we are seeing arts organizations say, "We have it. what are we doing if we don't risk? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing artists say, what, what am I doing if I am the person holding myself back? Maybe because I don't see myself reflected, maybe because mm -hmm. I'm 
sure anyone will listen or care or, or relate, but you're going to have organizationally and individually, you're going to have people now pushing forward, making a change. New artists are going to come forward. And I, it's so hard to give uh, attention when we go out as audience members, we're going to spend money. We're going to spend time. We're going to get a babysitter. It's hard to give the new Mm -hmm. our money, our time, our attention. And we're going to be so glad when we do do it. We're going to be so glad that we supported a new artist, that we went to a, a comedian, to a, to a singer, to a band, whatever it is, that we had maybe heard good things about or maybe didn't have so much press. We weren't familiar. Uh, when we step out of our own comfort zone as audience members and we support that, it makes more organizations will take those risks when we as audience members are are supporting it and heading out to see it and when those organizations see people want to hear new voices they're going to respond and so new voices new ideas um toward what in is the question for in my field in the in the family uh, uh whole family entertainment biz <laughs> of what what i do to that end is we like to think we create more. Mm -hmm. You've come in like I did at eight. You've been affected. Well, I can do that. And mm -hmm. you know what? I can do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, turn to whoever's with you. Well, get me up in there. Mm -hmm. Whether you put pen to paper, whether you do the audition like I did, whether you now are going to play guitar because you saw that guy play in the orchestra, play the drum, whatever it is. We in our business, our end of that, is that we keep it going. That sounds very grand, but I, I absolutely know it's true. And you, you can't do what I do and what we do at, at CTC if you don't know that that's absolutely true. And I've, I've seen it. I've been there now long enough where I've seen it. They've come in and said, I remember you from when I was five. Mm -hmm. I was with you when I was seven. Whatever it may be, I've gone that spectrum of time now that it comes to me and I have the receipts of that happening. But I know even when I don't hear about it, when it's a person that, that can't come up to me personally, I know that we are pushing that younger generation forward. That's a huge part of why we do what we do. And, and what do you see as the uh, shift in the world that you uh, expect or you desire? Uh, yeah, I always uh, sort of have viewed <clears throat> artists as... Uh, as angels, I guess, and people with a sort of sense of uh, a glimpse of the divine and a willingness or a compulsion, a, a uh, an assignment to uh, deliver a message, to deliver a viewpoint, to deliver an analysis or a feeling uh, that uh, will uh, serve as a education, a learning, an experiencing opportunity for community, right? So I think artists have that special role. And as you are thinking Renaissance, uh, what's the better world if there is one that you see ought to result from this new uh, wellspring of genius creativity uh, that we're gonna call Renaissance? What do you think? Again, from my standpoint, at CTC working uh, with these with these family audiences, I think we are assuming capacity greater. We are assuming a more uh, a capability of an emotional capacity. That means these scripts don't need to uh, to pander. They don't need to talk down. The scripts that we seek and the stories we seek coming out of this time, they are strong. They speak directly to uh, experiences that we know kids kids have. Mm -hmm. Somehow, somewhere, there became an assumption that childhood, maybe it's because adults talk a lot, and when we look back on it, we think it was simple or straightforward, instead of thinking how complex it is to be a young person. Mm -hmm. we, when we choose our stories at CTC moving forward, we assume the greatest emotional capacity, and we want to pick stories that do not simplify what it is to be a young person, whatever your individual experience is growing up, getting from, from birth to this grown up world. And I, I really see that in the season choices since we've come back, that we're taking the risk to go, you can handle it, you know this, you've lived this. 
And we as adults, we're more nervous about giving kids those stories than kids are about receiving them. And we're more nervous it's gonna go over their head than they are, and it doesn't, it lands. There are pieces of these stories that are universal, these scripts that we're performing. And it's, we talked about it when the preschool mom comes in. Guess oh, what? That's the mic drop. We're out of time. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving listening to you. <laughs> Autumn Ness, Children's Theater, writer of The Babble Lab. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.